Well, good morning once again and welcome back to the meeting. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming our second panel for the day. Uh, we have Carol Baverstock, who is Head of Admissions at the University of Aberdeen, my alma mater, I should say. Uh, Anne Duncan, Disability Service Manager at the University of Strathclyde. And Kirsty Knox, who is Assistant Head of Recruitment, Admissions and Participation Service at the University of the West of Scotland. So thank you very much indeed for coming to see us this morning. I'd like to open uh, with a question question about how each of your institutions fosters an atmosphere of inclusion, both around admissions, around um, provision within lectures and tutorials for students who are either BSL users or have other disabilities, and indeed how you foster that inclusion in the wider student experience. We heard a lot about how sometimes universities get it right in terms of support through lectures, but there is no <coughs> provision around the more social aspects of the university experience for, for students. Perhaps, Carol, you'd like to go first. Um, well, I mean, obviously, um, my expertise is in, in, in the admissions and to do with applications, so I'm not directly involved with the, re the registered student body or in terms of their kind of overall health and well-being. Um, but I know that at Aberdeen, um, the student experience is very much at the forefront of what we do. Um, there's more and more work going on to ensure that the student voice uh, is heard um, and that the student's needs are met. Um, the most recent appointment that, I, that I'm aware of um, is the university has appointed a, a mental health advisor and they have just been in position since um, September 2017. Um, that is part of an overall um, strategy uh, and action plan linked to mental health and well-being um, of, of all our students. Um, so that individual is looking to um, implement and evaluate um, the current strategies that are, that are in place. Um, but essentially, you know, our student support, our staff within registry are linked very much with um, uh, working with students on a, on a daily basis. We, at the application stage, are obviously looking to get as much information as we can, but it's all linked to what we receive through the application process and through UCAS. And while, whilst UCAS are making um, amendments to the process and the questions that they are asking, we are still not at the mercy, but we're still having to follow what um, the questioning that UCAS can can ask. Um, and they're also dealing with technology that that needs to be updated. So whilst they are they have a landscape of change um, in place, um, it's not moving necessarily at the pace that that's perhaps required. Um, they have focused on the postgraduate journey ahead of the undergraduate journey. Um, they have started work on that, but of course you, you, you can only um, get the data that, um, that UCAS actually ask of the applicants, and then that's what we have to work with um, um, in, in admissions. So um, that, that's one particular aspect, but um, Thank I'll stop you, there Carol. for now. Kirsty? Yeah, just to kind of what Carol was saying, um, like we are at, are at the mercy of UCAS. Um, I sit on the UCAS undergraduate advisory group, and we had a meeting two weeks ago down in Cheltenham. And yes, they have focused on postgraduate, and they do have initiatives for undergraduate. But I will be able to say they are behind schedule. Um, so any kind of fixes or tweaks that we need to deal with BSL or alternative methods, it's they're not a quick fix. There's a lot of a lead time. Next week, and I'll go into it's the UCAS um, practitioners update, the annual, annual review. review, and the new chief executive is there to present and give us an update on where they are as an organisation and their development. So we'll find out more next week. But they are behind schedule and initiatives they've had in the last 12 months. So anything that does come in terms of recommendation and putting into <coughs> practice, it's not going to be a quick turnaround, and this will impact all UK institutions. Okay, and Anne? Um, I'm coming at it from a 
different perspective um, to my uh, colleagues in the sense that I'm um, from a disability support perspective. So um, my colleagues in admission reflect similar um, sentiments as um, what Carol and Kirsty have shared in relation to the challenges um, with UCAS and potentially us being limited in terms of you know making progress or getting quick fixes within that area. Um, some work that has been happening um, at the University of Strathclyde is we have been um, working with our recruitment and um, international officers, the one, uh, their one section, um, to look at the information that is being um, shared and disseminated to applicants um, at you know recruitment fairs and um, to try and enhance that and enhance the profile of disability support provision in universities. Um, I know I was involved in um, a, an awareness raising day among um, school, uh, school guidance teachers, uh, generally from um, the west of Scotland, although it was open, um, it was open up Scotland wide. Um, and there, it, was, it was very, very clear from those dialogues that there was limited knowledge among our counterparts within schools about the support available to students with disabilities in universities and equally how students go about access and the support. We do work with a very, very different model um, of support at universities to um, the additional support needs model that is in place at schools and colleges. Um, so it's, um, we, we've worked, we're trying to work with schools to make them, um, to increase their awareness of that, to get students more ready and prepared for university and the type of um, the type of support that they will um, obtain at university. When we get students in, um, similar to um, what Carol had mentioned, one of our uh, focuses is at the moment is definitely student mental health. And um, we have just recently uh, launched a student mental health action plan within the university which um, has resulted in a significant investment in resources within that area um, it has also involved the amalgamation of disability service with wider support and well-being services and um, so we're all coming um, under the one umbrella um, so that we can better respond to the needs of this particular student group. In the previous session, um, there was mention of you know, it being mental health, it's something much, it is wider than disability. There are a huge number of students who are experiencing mental health issues at university, but they don't they don't meet the criteria to be um, recognised as having a disability under the Equality Act. Um, so we're working as an institution to try to better address the needs of the wider student population. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, can I just press you a little bit further on the issue of the wider student experience in terms of um, practices your institutions deploy to um, go beyond lecture theatres and tutorials in terms of integrating people who would, might otherwise face exclusion in that sort of social context of university? In our universities, there's a number of initiatives currently um, underway. One of the most recent ones I've been involved in is we're working in partnership with the student unions to launch a student minds peer support program that's targeted specifically at students experiencing um, mental health issues. In our own operational practices within um, the university's disability service, when we are looking at the support requirements of students with disabilities, um, we are looking at their support requirements not it's not simply as you know attending lectures it's what support do they need to enable them to access the student union to access clubs and societies what barriers is that going to pre present them with and how can we work with them to alleviate those bar barriers so we do um, take a much uh, a holistic approach it's not just about the easy part in general that's the most easiest thing to resolve is you know 
putting adjustments in for students to enable them to um, to accommodate to attend lectures and participate and succeed in the academic environment but that's only one aspect of university we have students living in halls and we want to make sure that they're integrated and they have the same or a comparable experience to all their other first year undergraduate graduate colleagues irrespective of what additional needs they have great can i ask mary to come in now Thank you, um, convener. Can I just ask um, our panel about the application process? Because we heard when we were taking evidence that quite often the, the first barrier to um, access to higher or university education is the application process because it's in, it's in one format. Um, and, and we heard evidence from um, one university that said that, um, alternative formats would be considered where it was appropriate. Um, and suggested that it should be UCAS that, that makes changes to the application process. So it's made at that level, not at individual um, university level. And I'd, I'd just be interested in, in, in your views on, on how open as institutions you are to allow students to apply in different methods and whether you agree that it should be UCAS that does that. We have, and um, there's, there's two application methods within the university. Um, predominantly, it is UCAS. Um, but also we work with agents and partners that are overseas. We have European partners as well who may come to study for one trimester rather than for a full year. So they can apply directly to the university. And again, that is an online application form, but we do have more flexibility in how we can tweak and amend it to alternative formats. It's not something we've got available at the moment, but we are exploring it. We've got a new uh, vice principal who's looking at the customer journey, the customer experience. So he has come in the last nine months, so I'm expecting some element of change. Um, but yeah, there's far more structure <clears throat> um, under kind of UCAS and what we can and cannot do, but more flexibility in our own application systems. And it is something that we are looking at just now. Helpful. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would just build on what Kirsty has said. I mean, essentially, as a member organisation with UCAS, you are under contract to ensure that your undergraduate applications um, are managed through UCAS. So the applicant is not applying directly to each of the institutions. Their application is submitted to UCAS and then the information is, 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 is passed on. Um, but obviously the world is changing. We are looking at lots of um, different uh, delivery types of education. It's not just about the on-campus experience. We have campuses overseas. We have um, distance learning um, arrangements. We have online learning. And Yes, our undergraduate population apply through UCAS. Our postgraduate uh, population will generally apply online. We have a lot more flexibility in terms of the questions that we can ask of those types of applicants. Interestingly, we have um, developed uh, a significant online profile mainly postgraduate level for September 2017 entry and there has been extensive discussion within Aberdeen about that journey for the applicant and the need to ask the level of questioning that perhaps is asked um, through the traditional undergraduate and postgraduate and um, trying to recognize that the online learner has different needs, different requirements, that um, the steps that and well, essentially the steps that they have to go through in order to become a registered student um, don't have to be exactly the same as it is it is for an undergraduate and uh, through UCAS and trying to kind of streamline it and make it much easier and less questioning in terms of the app, of the questions that are asked or the, the procedure they have to go through because an online learner is probably never going to be on campus. Thank you. And did you want to add anything? My response would be very similar to Kirsty's yeah. in the sense that um, there are the restrictions in terms of UCAS, but mm -hmm. um, when we're accepting, you, you know, the standard, the localised application form for direct course, uh, direct applicants to the institution, there is more flexibility um, in how those applications are received, um, and there wouldn't be an issue with them being um, considered in an alternative format. But, but obviously, Kirsty, given the comments that you made previously about um, the length of time it takes UCAS to change, mm -hmm. any change won't happen in the immediate future. Yes. Um, they've, in the last year at UCAS, they've got a new chief executive. She came in just in July. 
Um, so the first time we'll meet her on Tuesday. Um, they've had their uh, marketing director um, leave. They've had their policy and stats person leave as well. So there's a lot. And the person, Giles, who actually worked on the <coughs> content of the online application form has also left as well. So a lot of staff have exited UCAST in the last, I would say, six months. Um, so at the meeting I was at, they had one of the directors in, don't worry, it's not a sinking ship, all is still well, everything's moving forward. Um, so there's some kind of element of frustration. Um, I attend that meeting with the University of Edinburgh, and you know, we've been given a wish list of, from all Scottish universities of what we would like them to focus on and prioritise, and we're still unclear, actually, what they have focused and prioritised on. Um, so we're hoping we'll get more of a, a sense on Tuesday, actually, this is the direction of where they're going mm -hmm. and have a clear understanding of what the timescale is. Because yes. I had an understanding that by next year we'd have this in play and I'm really not quite sure it may be 2019 and if this is a slippage that's happened. I, I think I would just add um, that, of course, UCAS, um, they have been criticised in the past before by universities when they've tried to bring about change without due notice mm -hmm. because when it's a technology-based change, each university and how they receive the data from UCAS will be managed differently with different systems. So there is there is justification for um, you know a long lead-in time. Um, the other aspect, um, which is perhaps a delicate one in that you know, Scotland as a voice in terms of the number of institutions mm -hmm. in Scotland, we are kind of, a, of about 16 in number. Um, there, are over, there are nearly 400 institutions who are members of UCAS. And through um, the groups that, that the Scottish universities are part of on the admissions, you know, we are very vocal in our views um, and our wishes and um, you know we are we, we don't like to be forgotten uh, but uh, we are a small voice um, when UCAS are listening to the rest of their customer base and that includes applicants and schools as, as well as all the institutions south of the border. Thank you. Can, can I just interrogate that revelation that we've had a massive change in senior management at UCAS? So it strikes me that UCAS is part of the jigsaw here in terms of improving uh, access and uh, widening access. Is that a problem? Is, is this an organisation in distress? And is that going to be a barrier to uh, our efforts here? We were At the meeting I was at, we were um, comforted with the fact that um, Claire wants to halt where we are right now and doesn't want to rush. Um, she wants to get a sense of where we are, where they are as an organisation, and then identify the key things they now want to work on. So they might be behind schedule, but she wants to halt where they are and get a real sense and involve all the petitioners and all the HEPs, um, rather than sort of ignoring our voice. She wants to work in partnership, which is a bit of a change, I would sort of say. Yes. Um, so, yes. And, and, and I think to you... I think to UCAS, um, you know, they have brought about a lot of change already. Um, they have focused on different groups um, of, of their customers. So they have, um, to some extent, improved the, the way in which the information is available to potential applicants. They've improved um, the systems that allow universities to promote um, the degrees and the information relating to the degrees. So. Um, there is a huge investment going on behind the scenes in terms of their technology and their developments. I think they've just hit a little bit of a, a stall yeah. at the moment, um, and it's a pause, but I think they're um, looking to progress with renewed vigour. But I think they have to get a mandate from the members, and that will be through um, the annual update, which is next week, and um, further development at the conference, the, our annual conference in March. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to bring in Gail Ross now. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel. Thank you for coming along. Um, Mary Fee touched on the applications process. And um, when the committee took evidence um, on this topic, there was um, a, a, a certain number of people that said there needed to be greater transparency in how applications are proce processed. And Carl, you touched on the, the UCAS side of it there. Um, that included how contextual applications operate. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about those? 
Okay, so in, t in terms of, um, you know, the contextual information, I mean, obviously, through um, universities, outcome agreements and our discussions with the Funding Council, these are constantly evolving. So there are additional fields of information, information that we're analysing within the, the application. So, yes, um, universities will present their minimum entry requirements um, that's looking to give an indication of kind of what you need to have in order to be considered. Um, but there are other factors and um, I think universities are doing more and more to kind of explain what those other factors are and how they are used or measured and assessed within the process. Um, it's a journey that's that's not complete by any means. Um, there's probably, well, there will be more and more that, that can be said um, to give, you know, um, our audience more information. But obviously we're looking to get a sense of the, the experiences that an applicant has had to date through their schooling, through wider issues. Um, it is difficult because the information that is presented in the application is what we've got to go on. Um, and telling the story uh, can, can be problematic um, because some of that information is very, very, can be very, very sensitive. And of course, they're putting it into kind of a great big UCAS system in terms of a personal statement or, or, or a reference. So I know that universities do a lot to engage with and do outreach work so that we're working with the schools directly through a lot of different environments sort of aim for uni at Aberdeen for the REACH project to give applicants the confidence to kind of talk to us or communicate with us off record so that we can marry that information with the application and we're, we're trying to do more and more in our outreach works to get that message across with, with the extensive work that we're doing with schools so that we have all of that information um, and, and to encourage applicants to declare and answer the questions as best they can in the UCAS application and as honestly as they, as they can. So we can then enter into that, into that dialogue. I think admissions is much more now about a kind of continued dialogue. It's not just a case of taking an application and making a decision yes or no. There's engagement um, with applicants and... and um, schools and their advisors in a, a greater a greater way than it than it once was it's it's not straight well it was never straightforward and it's even less straightforward forward now so okay um, um, just really to add to that um, and it's probably one of the things just to emphasize is um, there we do a lot of work as well with the academic with the selectors um, when the applications come in and it's you know and particularly to do um, consider in detail students' personal statements and we know now that there is increased, ever increasing pressures on, you know, applicants to, um, to illustrate this really, really broad range of external experiences. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, it's looked favourably for students to have had work experience or voluntary experience, which for students with disabilities or applicants with disabilities, that may not be tangible, and particularly people, some applicants with more significant disabilities. So for them to get their two A's and three B's or to get their five A's or whatever, that's the only thing they could do is to focus on their academic work. So we've been working with um, academic selectors, you know, to take that into consideration that it's not just about the personal statement and sometimes it's okay just to look at the entry requirements, you know, and to, to, things do, it, it, the contextualised approach is great and it is about considering things in context. But um, I do think there's, and it's not just an applicants, it's when students get in and, you know, students going on into employment, there's so, so much pressure on them to do more than just obtain a degree, which in itself is hugely challenging for the bulk of students, irrespective of whether or not they have additional needs or disabilities. So it's kind of making selectors aware of that and getting that to follow through into employment or can, is another challenge. Okay, thank you. Kirsty, have you got anything to add? Um, I mean, for UWS, we're quite a different organisation and we've got quite a broad-based student population. Just the other day, we've, I think over 50% comes from SID 40 of our student population. 
Um, so we do have quite a wide widening access agenda. We've got an outreach team, student recruitment team who work very closely together. Um, but I'm sensing in terms of discussions this morning, slightly more that we could be doing in terms of our disability team as well, enhancing the information that's certainly given out. But we do have a strong sense in our outreach across the university and we work closely with our secondary schools and AFE colleges. Um, but yeah, so we do have that. How do you think that, um, or, or do you have any evidence of your individual institutions taking forward contextualised um, applications as part of the national BSL plan? Um, so I can just respond to it in terms of where our institution is with the BSL plan and it is it's, we're at the stage where it's up for discussion at our Equality and Diversity Strategy Committee meeting in a couple of weeks. So this is this kind of we're at the early stages in terms of implementation. But the recommendations from this report will be considered in detail when we're implementing the BSL plan. Um, I was also going to ask um, what, what challenges that you see arising from the implementation of the plan that might be a I don't know if it's an easier question to answer, <laughs> more, more straightforward one to answer. I mean, certainly, I, I, I was given some information by our um, disability um, uh, team, and I, I think it was raised um, last time I was here in the, in, in the chamber, the mention was made. Um, the northeast of Scotland, uh, there is a particular challenge with regards to BSL interpreters. There's, I think, the describe it as a dearth of interpreters in the northeast of Scotland and that 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 presents a real challenge um, for students that would require those services um, if they're coming to study in and around Aberdeen not just at, at, at the University of Aberdeen but Robert Gordon at, at, at the college um, that that is of major concern um, and that will be something that our um, our, our disability and our student support team will be, will, will be taking on board. I think they have um, been attending meetings recently. Um, they have been working with our um, equalities uh, officer within our human resources section. Um, the, uh, they've made mention of a lady called um, Alison who is going to be uh, working with both the FE college and the um, HE sector um, in, in the northeast of Scotland to help kind of take that forward as well. But, but that's one of our particular concerns. We have a member of staff that's um, sort of training herself um, to become a BSL and she now has a video on the website uh, under our student support section and she's been engaging with each of our six schools and having a, a general welcome for each of the six schools so that has been discussed. We've also been looking at um, working with a um, rich media company on our video, video content on program information, why come to UWS, uh, sort of virtual tours and we're looking, we've got a BSL slant for that as well so we do have lots of plans developing but we do have one video online just now on the website. Um, I think for us in particular coming from a student support perspective, I think probably one of the challenges is um, going to be getting the sector to recognise the BSL plan as something that extends beyond the mere support provision for BSL users within higher education. You know, it's kind of looking at it as opposed to because it, it, it's been passed and I know from speaking to my counterparts at other institutions it is very much being perceived as something that's a kind of a student support issue whereby the fundamentals of the BSL Act is you know to get BSL recognised as you know a, as a language it's a culture in its own right so um, pract practically we'll have the same challenges as everyone else in terms of resources and the availability of sign language interpreters to bring some of this work forward but equally it's the recognition of of it being something much broader okay thank you, thank you gail I, i'd like to pick up on that last point Anne. and I, I was struck when you said earlier as well that you know the stage at which you are at in your institution in terms of the implementation of the bsl plan is that it's up for discussion i think that there is 
clearly a tremendous amount of goodwill around BSL and an understanding that we should be doing more. It's important to recognise that it is an official minority language rather than just a, an equalities agenda. This is this is a culture in and of itself. Um, but. Perhaps also I, I'm reflecting on Kirsty's remarks about the fact that you have one member of staff who's teaching herself. And do institutions need to do more to proactively recruit and train in-house translators um, to answer the challenge of the BSL plan? Well, that was an easy question. OK. <laughs> How? <laughs> and who? That's harder. That's harder. Yeah, I think the member of staff that we have, you know, she's very keen. Mm -hmm. You know, she wants to do more, um, but it seems to, you know there's conflicting views. I think within the organisation on priority and, and role and, and remit, and I think unless we have a dedicated person that that is the role, I think the kind of confusion or the struggle will carry on. Uh, I'm hoping that's not just a UWS, but mm -hmm. that's where we certainly have feel there's a conflict. We'll build it into your continuous professional development of lecturing staff or teaching staff? Or could you? I'm not aware, but certainly something we could, yes. Mm. <coughs> okay. I think that would be a invite you to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. David Torrance. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to back, go back to Brexit and the impact it will have on the university sector and applications and the possible loss of some of the European equality laws. Can I also ask about a loss of European funding and the trickle-down effect that will have across the whole university sector? How it will affect? Well, cer certainly, um, I think we'll be finding when we go to our UCAS meeting next week, we'll be getting some statistical information with regards to applications for the 2017 cycle. We had an informal UCAS meeting of practitioners on Monday and uh, we got some advance information which would suggest that acceptances to the Scottish universities has increased um, for 2017 entry um, and that is uh, contrary to what has happened south of the border and that the increase in acceptances to Scottish universities has predominantly been from Scottish domiciled based students. Um, but of course, Scotland operates in a different environment to south of the border. There is no cap in the south, on the south of the border. Um, universities are free to take as many students as they want to, um, and that's not the same situation in Scotland. There is a control uh, on the overall population within within the institutions, um, and that has to be, has to be, to be fa factored in. But essentially, um, there is an expectation, because it's already started to happen, that applications from uh, European Union applicants um, is on the decline. So we are, we are seeing fewer applications um, coming into UCAS, certainly at undergraduate level. And in terms of overall kind of staffing, in terms of overall funding, you know, all universities in Scotland will have that concern about the, the links that they have with the European uh, other universities, other academic staff, the access to um, the funding um, that's available through the European Union structure will all have an impact. And I would suspect all universities um, are working at looking at, at the impact that this will have. We have noticed a few lecturers already leaving uh, UWS, uh, European uh, lecturers come back to their home country um, already, and it's not a significant number, but you know maybe two or three um, as a result already. You did mention there about the loss of European funding and the impact of having staff. Are you saying it could be possibly uh, staff jobs made me redundant because of the loss of European funding? Um, no, I, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily. I'm not party to, 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 to that kind of, you know, sort of information. But I, I think, um, you know, universities will be concerned that they will not have full inclusion in terms of um, the developments uh, and being at the table in terms of um, kind of research activities because we're not part of the European Union. Thank you. 
Thank you, David. And on a different topic, and we are coming up against our time, but we certainly have time for Annie Wells, always. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I was really encouraged to hear you speaking about mental health and making that more of a, a sort of a priority within the, the universities. Probably for me, it's we know that people with who disclose mental health have the, one of the lowest outcomes. How do we, how are you looking to encourage those to actually disclose they've got a mental health um, issue? And are we looking at staff training as well so that there's sort of a more, the, the sort of a covers there all the time and not just at the admission stage or application stage? I had mentioned um, at the start that we have just re launched a student mental health action plan and um, as part of that it's very much focused on students mental health and overall uh, well-being, mental well-being um, and we recognise that it's fundamental that we flip things on their head because um, we know, we're, we're encouraged in the fact that the number of students declaring mental health issues is increasing. Um, however, we do know that it is significantly underreported. Um, we know that many of them, as I had said earlier, don't equate having a mental health issue to having a disability, and rightly so, they shouldn't. So basically, what we're trying to do is implement uh, um, uh, or have a new strategy whereby we're focusing very much on prevention and awareness raising. We're working very closely with the Students' Union to implement a number of um, initiatives to try and work with the general student population. We know that the number is accessing any of the support services, not just disability counselling, health services within universities. While demand for these services from the students group is increasing, we do know we're, we're, we're only getting a very, very small proportion of the number numbers of students presenting with mental health issues. So we're doing a lot of work with the Students' Union. We are also working with um, staff across academic departments. We plan to roll out, we're, we've started a mental health first aid training uh, programme, which is going to be rolled out across the, um, across the whole university. And we are working with academic departments in the very early stages but what we're hoping to have is we already have disability contacts within every department and we're considering extending their role to be um, disability and wellbeing advisors. We're at very early stages of discussion um, about this, but it's to recognise that the bulk of students aren't coming near student support. So we need to work with our academic colleagues and, again, this, the student population. We know that students are more likely to tell their friends about challenges they're experiencing as opposed to you know, speaking to either an academic member of staff or, staff or support service. So we need to um, work with that cohort um, and upskill them to enable them to better support each other as well. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Any further questions? No, that was that was me. I'm really encouraged, though, that mental health has been taken seriously within the, the sort of disability framework of the universities. Thank you, Annie. Just a final question from me. Um, we are interested as a committee in the review of student support, which is expected, but we're not cited on when that's likely to be forthcoming. Uh, can you shed any light on this for us? Um, and do, is it in terms of SFC outcome agreements? Is that yes. Yeah. Um, SFC were actually at UWS yesterday. Um, I wasn't party to the meeting, um, but I do know from a colleague, although we haven't been given the outcome agreements, we've been given it's a ministerial letter of guidance. Mm -hmm. And within that, it talks about there's sections on widening access, gender balance, STEM, etc. and part of the intensification, I think Joe and Hem talked about earlier on. So we haven't been given our full outcome agreement as yet, but we are aware that it does give more content to what okay. we discussed at the committee. Thank you. Well, I think that draws us to the end of our questioning, unless any of my colleagues have any further follow-ups, in which case, thank you so much for your time this morning. Again, very helpful to our consideration of this issue. Um, aware that there were sometimes questions that you weren't, didn't feel comfortable answering for your institutions, if they're more than welcome to write to us if they want to 
provide clarification. I'm sorry if, you, if at any point you felt put on the spot. But similarly, if you feel that there's something you would have liked to have said that didn't have the opportunity to, then by all means get back in touch and we can continue this as an open dialogue. So thank you very much for joining us and I'll suspend the committee to go into private session. Thank you.